You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome to Bird's Eye View on Pet Life Radio. I'm Dr. Lori Hess, and I'm here with Dr. Michelle Ravitch from the Veterinary Center for Birds and Exotics. And today, we're really excited to talk to you about different types of birds for different types of people. Aren't we, Dr. Ravitch? Yes, it should be an interesting topic. So we have a lot to tell you, so stay tuned, and we'll be right back in just a few minutes to tell you more. Stay perched. We'll be soaring back right after these messages. It's dinner time in America, where more pet parents trust PetSmart for natural and expert recommended foods than any place else. And now, we've added more than 100 new varieties to our already wide selection of your favorite brands, like Simply Nourish, Authority, Wellness, Science Diet, and more. Do what's best for your pet. At PetSmart, happiness in store. Go to PetSmartDeal.com to find out this week's coupon code and save up to 30% on food, treats, toys, and more. And get free shipping on orders of $49. Go to PetSmartDeal.com, P-E-T-S-M-A-R-T-D-E-A-L.com. Pet Life Radio, the number one pet radio network on the planet, joins forces with iHeartRadio to put the power of your pets in your pocket. Awesome. Download the iHeartRadio app and rock Pet Life Radio on your phone, on your tablet, on your Xbox, in your car. Pet talk, pet tunes, and fun pet times. Pet Life Radio and iHeartRadio. Positively possum. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Bird's Eye View. I'm Dr. Lori Hess, and I'm here with Dr. Michelle Ravitch, and we're going to talk a little bit today about different bird species for different types of people. This is a pretty interesting topic that Dr. Ravitch and I, as bird veterinarians, deal with every day, right? We do. I think a lot of people commonly think of parrots as being the bird primarily owned, and some of you may be surprised about all the other types of birds we see that are also owned as pets. So we thought we'd start out by going through some of the other types of birds and then get into parrots afterwards. Yes, there are quite a few birds out there that people don't even realize that people keep and that can make phenomenal pets. So what should we start with, Dr. Etch? I think canaries are a great place to start with, especially since you have two of your own. I think they're great. I do love canaries. I've grown up with canaries, and they're phenomenal little birds for many reasons. I mean, they're great to look at. They're pretty, and they come in all different colors. And most of all, the males sing. And if you've never heard a canary sing, you really need to get on the Internet and hear one, because it's like opera. I mean, they're just phenomenal. Maybe you want to mention a little bit, Dr. Ravitch, about why they sing. Well, they sing to both attract mates and to compete with other males and kind of establish their territory. So it's all about the breeding season and and reproductive hormones. Interestingly, I had one male canary, and for his first season, he sang quite a bit. But I had taken him from a breeding situation, so he really wasn't used to hearing all the other canaries around him, sort of learning that song and learning why that hormonal surge, because there were no girls around. So um, I was actually speaking to my breeder friend about this and how I could get him to sing again. And interestingly, what she told me to do, and it absolutely worked, was to get another male canary and put him in a cage next to the first male. So one would sing, and then the other one would be goaded on to sing and compete with him. We didn't get a girl. There was no girls, no girls in any cages. And the two of them were just competing back and forth. And they do this every spring when it's time to compete for mates. So they're really amazing. And it's beautiful. Yeah, I think they make uh, great pets for anyone, especially if you have a musical background or if you play an instrument or sing. But um, people, you know, if you're looking for a pet and you live in a small apartment or a small house and you can't have something that makes a lot of noise or takes up a lot of space, um, they're a great pet for that. They still do need the proper setup and the proper care, but they can be uh, fairly low maintenance. Yep. I mean, small bird, small cage, very, very simple to keep. You know, they're fairly hardy. They get some basic diseases, but uh, nothing too horrible. They live a few years. I mean, I know them to live as many as, you know, 10, 11 years. Most of them live on average probably about five to seven years. But again, beautiful birds, very simple, great pets for families. 
And you can also get a big variety. A lot of people think of your typical yellow canary, but if you look online or look in different books, there's a huge variety in different feathers and different colors, and they can look quite impressive. Yeah, they're really a lot of fun. They're kind of addictive. When you get one, you want another one of a different variety, and then suddenly you have all these singing canaries. Similar to canaries are finches, same type of family. Um, and finches are even more addictive than canaries because they talk about varieties. Ugh, they come in so many different varieties and colors. So they're really, really beautiful. And they like to live in pairs. Finches definitely like to live in pairs. And again, they're small. They're not the kind of birds you handle so much, more, more the kind of birds you watch, right? So, right, right. So another good bird for a small house or an apartment or someone who's not home a lot, but um, they can provide companionship and, they, and entertainment. And I think some people actually look at it as a sort of hobby, having different finches and having flocks and, and, you know, and that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, usually I know lots of people begin with just a pair of finches and then often they'll breed and you'll have more than a pair of finches soon. And then sometimes you get into sort of collecting them where you want to get other colors of different species. And there are some rules about not mixing and matching certain species together. And that's something that if you do get into finch breeding, you should talk to a professional veterinarian or a breeder about because there are some recommendations that they have about that. But in general, you know, they're beautiful. They're interesting to look at. They're very active during the day. And if you really want some activity and something to to watch. They could be very therapeutic to watch these finches, very relaxing. So they're a lot of fun, again, if you're not looking for not looking for a very long-lived bird or one that, you know, you handle that much, but certainly something to look at. So the next group we are going to talk about are chickens. Um, and some of you may actually have chickens yourselves, but we actually see a large amount of chickens as patients here at our hospital. They're a very common pet. It's very popular now to have backyard chickens and not even backyard chickens. Some people keep their chickens in their house as their pet, just as you would a dog or cat or any other animal. And they seem to get a lot out of it and they seem to really adore their chickens. Yeah, I mean, chickens are very affectionate. They definitely bond to their owners. Um, as we mentioned for the other bird species, there are so many types of chickens. I mean, we all sort of think of this sort of generic looking, you know, brownish, orangish feathered chicken, but there are so many fancy breeds of chickens with different feather patterns, different colors, feathers on their feet, feathers and different patterns on their head, and they're beautiful. Big ones, little ones, I mean, it's really become quite, quite a hobby to many people, and many people do get chickens so that they can eat the chicken's eggs, which sounds very nice, but you do have to remember that if you're going to do that, you need to make sure that the chickens are treated and that um, we check the stool to make sure that there's no parasites because you don't want to be eating eggs that have parasites in them. You want to keep them healthy. So all these birds, as we mentioned, should all have checkups to make sure that you're treating them right, feeding them well, have the right setup so that they can thrive and you can enjoy them. Mm -hmm. Along the lines of chickens, there are certainly other sort of game birds in that same family that if you have some land, and usually these are outdoor birds, they're really nice to keep. And, and again, we see some very, very interesting pets here that traditionally have not been considered pets, but I think in the past few years, more people have uh, begun to think of them as pets, right? Mm -hmm. And the game birds are the pheasants, peafowl, including some of the peacocks, the beautiful ones that you see, and guinea fowl, which is chicken-like and a little bit smaller. Mm -hmm. But um, many Many, many people have one or several of them. If you have a backyard or a decent amount of property, they can be a lot of fun. They can definitely control some of the parasites in your backyard. They eat all kinds of little grubs and worms, and, and um, they're very interesting to watch run around. You do have to protect them from predators. So if you live anywhere where there are you know, foxes or other animals, that you know, even dogs, you have to be careful if you have a big dog. Um, you have to keep them separate. But you can certainly get a setup where they're a lot of fun to watch. They can be very affectionate. And they do love space and to run around out outdoors. One comment that we should make, because we do see this a lot, and we've seen some problems with this. Chickens can actually carry a parasite that they will spread to some of these other game birds, especially birds like turkeys and peacocks. So you never want to house chickens with any of these other birds. They should always be kept very separate. Very Just important. As a side note. Yeah, that's very important. It's not something everybody would think of necessarily. But, uh, you know, sometimes we do see properties where they have multiple different types of birds, and they do have to be penned separately, housed separately, fed separately. Um, again, lots of fun to have these birds, but you really need to learn about what kind of food they need and their setup, and that's something that we advise people on to make sure that every different species has, you know, stays healthy and, and they are happy. 
And I think the last kind of big non-parrot group that we haven't hit yet are the ducks and the geese. We also see a surprising amount of ducks and geese, again, some of which live part of the time in their owner's or their family's house. The biggest thing they need is they absolutely need water. They cannot be on land all the time. They'll get sores on the bottom of their feet. They'll have poor feather quality. They'll have respiratory infections. So they definitely need some area where they can swim. But they're very interactive. They're very inquisitive. And they can make fun pets as well. Absolutely. And we, we actually do see some ducks and geese that do live part of the time inside people's houses, but certainly they need it a minimum if they don't have a little pond. They need a big a big kiddie pool to swim around in outside, you know, and some access to sunlight. And one thing we should, you know, make clear on all of this is, you know, while ducks and geese are wild birds and you can go outside and see them flying around the wild, we are not suggesting in any way that you go capture one of those wild birds and make it a pet. There are many ducks and geese that are raised to be captive. They're raised from being little chicks from the egg to be a domesticated pet. And that's a very different animal from the ones that are flying free in your yard. So remember, again, it's not about capturing wildlife that's illegal. It's not proper for the bird. Um, This is about really getting a pet and raising it as a pet from the beginning. That's a good point. And if you actually ever found um, an abandoned baby, injured wild bird, the best thing to do is to get in contact with a veterinarian's office or a rehabilitator who can take that animal and help, help it get back to health so it could be released back into its natural environment. Yes, very, very important point. So again, ducks and geese, you know, another family of animals that we're seeing lots of people keeping as pets. They're really fun. They do live quite a long time. They do have certain requirements, as we said, water and certain types of food. And, and they can get sores on their feet if they're kept inside all the time on, on inappropriate kind of flooring. And they do need softer ground. You know, again, they're meant to be floating outside. And just because they're captive doesn't mean they don't need the same things as those wild birds do. So I think, I mean, what we want to emphasize is that for first-time bird owners, people who are considering getting a bird and they've never had a bird before, we're going to mention some uh, wonderful parrots that you can have, but finches and canaries, as we mentioned, are great choices if you want little birds. You know, more of an investment are the game birds, the chickens, um, ducks and geese, great animals to choose from too. Again, a little bit more labor-intensive, a little bit more of a commitment because their requirements are a little bit more. But again, all of these birds can make phenomenal pets for the right people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think at this point we're going to take a little break and we will be right back to tell you a lot more about some other terrific pets for first-time owners. Stay perched. We'll be soaring back right after these messages. Hi, this is Tim Link, animal communicator and pet expert and host of Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Have you ever wanted to know what your pet is really thinking? Do you want to find out if they truly understand what you're trying to tell them? Ever wish you could build a better understanding and closer relationship with your pet? Well, now you can. Learning to communicate with animals is a four-part on-demand workshop. In the workshop, you'll learn the essential techniques that are necessary to communicate with animals, including what is animal communication, breathing correctly to achieve the perfect state to communicate with your animals at a deeper level, using guided meditation exercises and method to communicate with animals, and how to send and receive information from your animals. So if you're wanting to learn how to communicate and connect with your animals at a deeper level, visit PetLifeRadio.com forward slash workshop and purchase and download Learning to Communicate with Animals. You'll be glad you did. Hey there, pet parents. This is Christy Vaughn, host of The Doggy Dish. Do you love your furry companion? Do you love making him or her healthy treats but can't seem to find the time? Great news. The Doggy Dish is the perfect show for you. Every episode is chock full of healthy and easy recipes that are made with ingredients you most likely have on hand. Tune into The Doggy Dish for yummy and healthy recipes for your canine kids. Every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets on Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Bird's Eye View. I'm Dr. Lori Hess, and I'm here with Dr. Michelle Ravitch, and we were just discussing different bird species for different people. We mentioned some canaries, finches, chickens, ducks, geese, and some other game birds that you might not think of. But I think the most common set of birds that we think about um, as pets are parrots, right, Dr. Ravitch? Yes, we do see, I, I think, maybe half of the patients we see are parrots, so they're very, very common. 
And parrots includes a wide variety of parrots. The heading parrots includes things, everything from parakeets, cockatiels, conures, parrotlets, all the way up to African gray parrots and Amazon parrots and macaws and cockatoos. All of those birds are included under the heading parrots. And parrots are can vary quite significantly from one species to another. They even come from different continents. There are parrots from South America, from Africa, from the Australia region, and they can all be very different from each other. Yeah, and again, I mean, these are all parrots, but when we're trying to match a person or a family or a group of people with a type of bird, there are so many considerations, not only just size, as we mentioned, but again, different requirements in terms of food, space, um, attention, the social neediness of the bird. That's a big thing that people don't really think about. Mm -hmm. So again, before anyone rushes out and gets a parrot, parrots can be phenomenal animals, small, big, you know, medium size, but um, there are a lot of things to think about because these are big commitments, long-term commitments for many of the bigger birds that live a long time. And you really have to look at your family, your environment, the amount of time you have, the the finances available to care for these animals because they can live some of the big birds decades and decades. So that's one, I think we want to just mention some of those factors. Yeah, that's a good point. Some, you know, we know a lot of people who have gotten a parrot, a pet parrot for their children and not realize that the child is going to move out of the house well before the parrot has passed on. And so that's something that you have to anticipate either taking care of that parrot yourself or having the um, your grown child take them with you. And also for older people, kind of taking into account uh, that their bird may actually outlive them. Yes, we actually have to counsel some older people about putting these birds in their will because some of these bigger parrots will live, you know, 50, 60 years if they're cared for properly. So, again, they're wonderful animals, but this is just one factor is age and and the time that you really do need to care for these animals. I think another big thing is that, you know, parrots can be great, but for families with small children, we don't necessarily recommend big macaws, big beaks, little teeny fingers. You know, there could be problems there. So maybe we should talk a little bit about for families with small children, what birds we would recommend. Sure. So if the birds are not necessarily meant to be handled, some of the smaller birds we were talking about, like canaries and finches, can be very captivating for small children. They're very active. They can be very vocal and sing a lot. They can be very colorful. Um, And also bajuragars, which commonly are known as parakeets. They're a type of parrot that can also be good for small children, typically not to be handled, typically also just to be watched. But they're also very colorful and active and inquisitive. For families with small children where the children want to learn how to handle the bird and the bird is going to be their companion, cockatiels are the number one bird I think of. Um, they're very common in, in families. They can be very docile. They can be trained. They will typically love their owner very much. We have a lot of families that have a type of parrot called a caic which is from South America, and they're very playful birds. They love to play and hang upside down, and that's oftentimes a very good bird for families with children as well. Some other smaller birds like green cheek conures can be very good with small children, as long as, you know, as long as the children are taught how to properly handle them and to be very gentle with them. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of smaller birds, but remember, all of these birds, they can make great pets, but they can get spooked, they can nip, and remember that birds use their beak kind of as their third arm, they don't have fingers, so they'll grab onto things and pull themselves up, and some people misinterpret that that little reach with the beak can be a bite, and it's really not a bite, but, um, you know, when birds are scared, they will nip a little bit, so it's really important, regardless of which type of these birds you have with small children, that you always supervise them. You know, children move very quickly, they can be very loud, they can be startling to any size bird. So just remember, you know, children and birds can be great together just with supervision. Exactly. We had touched on some good birds for people that live in apartments or places where they can't have a lot of noise. And we had said the canaries and finches were good birds for um, those types of situations. Other parrots that can be very good for those situations are things like parakeets and cockatiels. They they don't take up a lot of space. They don't tend to make that much noise. And some of the smaller conures, like green cheek conures, some of the parrotlets. um, Parrotlets can be very affectionate. Lovebirds, Ionis parrots tend to not be uh, very loud either. Yeah, and those all vary in size. I mean, a parrotlet is a little teeny parrot about the size of a parakeet. It's even a little smaller. Um, that We always joke that they're big bird personalities and little teeny bird bodies, and they are, you know, very kind of dominant. They're a lot of fun. You know, lovebirds you've probably all seen. A pionis parrot is a little unusual. I actually have a pionis, and they're a little bit bigger. They're sort of a 
moderate size, medium sized parrot, but they are gentler. Um, they're not as loud, um, very colorful. There's a variety of them. And if you do live, you know, in a house where you have neighbors or an apartment where, you, you know, we don't have a ton of space and um, you don't want to have a ton of noise, they can be terrific, terrific pets. I mean, I have thoroughly enjoyed my Pionis, who's almost 19, 20 years old now, and I grew up in an apartment. So it was great to have him around and have a, a great bird that I could handle and watch, but that he doesn't really scream a lot. So make lots of noise. So again, small children, there's a variety of these birds to choose from. Some are more handleable than others, different colors, different requirements. Um, but there's no reason that uh, a family can't enjoy a small parrot if the whole family participates in the care of the bird um, and realizes that it is a long-term commitment. You know, for a busier or noisier household, there are certain birds, you know, if it's okay for there to be noise, cockatiels and caiques are great because they are a little louder, a little more playful. If you're talking about a quieter household where maybe you don't want to have as much noise and commotion, um, there are some other birds, like cockatiels can go in both kinds of households, but budgies or parakeets, as we mentioned before, you know, not as loud, lots of fun to interact with, more looking at them than handling them, but again, not really loud birds. They fit nicely into a house that doesn't have a ton of noise and commotion going on. One other type of bird that we haven't mentioned is the African gray, right? Do you want to mention something about that? Yeah, so if you have a, a quieter household, maybe, you know, maybe no children running around. And there are many households with children that have African greys and they fit in just fine. But um, African greys can be very uh, good birds for kind of lower key households, assuming that you have the time to devote to them. They do need a lot of attention and time and they do need some time devoted to training and working with them. They still can be a little loud, you know, once or twice a day. They might give a scream here or there, but they're actually known for being very good talkers and being very intelligent. So if it's a, a mature couple and they're looking for a pet and they have, you know, a set schedule and time to devote to that particular bird. An African gray parrot can be a really great pet for that situation. Absolutely. They're phenomenal. I mean, they're really, again, very, very long-lived, great personality, great talkers. They will get bored sometimes and pick themselves and you know, develop some behavioral problems if they're not in the proper setting and they're not getting proper attention, but really, really super, super smart birds. Terrific birds. Again, a little bigger, handleable. Um, again, the bigger the bird, usually the longer the life and a little bit more of a commitment. And it's always important to sp with any pet to really look into what you're getting into beforehand just so you know what to expect, so you know what kind of setup you need and you're prepared for kind of the needs for, for that bird. Some of the other birds that um, are very popular pets but we haven't quite mentioned yet include birds like cockatoos, amazons, and macaws. These are all bigger birds. Cockatoos, there are many different types of cockatoos and some can actually be on the smaller side, but they're all bigger birds and as Dr. Hess said, they're generally longer lived. And you do have to think about that they will need larger cages, more toys, more food, more long-term medical care. So planning for the financial aspect of that is important as well. Yeah, I mean, I know I have a cockatoo and I love him, but they are birds that need to rip and shred and tear things up. And I will get toys that can be expensive sometimes, and he will go through them in 10 minutes. <laughs> so, you know, you really have to keep that in mind. Big birds are terrific, and there are many, many of them. But again, as we mentioned cockatoos before, very, very needy birds, very socially needy. They can't be left alone in cages. They're the one probably top personality of bird that we see that really, really needs to be with a person several hours a day or they do develop behavioral problems, which is great if you live at home, you know, you're ho home all day long, you work out of your home, you're home a lot of hours, you don't do a lot of traveling. Um, a cockatoo could be an amazing companion, just like a dog. And it's some cockatoos, you know, again, live into their 50s and 60s. So these can be passed down from generation to generation. But again, not the right pet for everybody if you're out of the house a lot, if you travel, if you just don't have time for them. Exactly. And some of these bigger birds are probably not the best birds for a first-time bird owner. You definitely need some experience, especially with macaws, who can be quite large. You need to be prepared and, and kind of understand bird behavior before you get into owning one of these birds. Yes. So Amazons and macaws are a couple of other types of birds that we see very commonly that people are attracted to because their Amazons can be phenomenal talkers. They really live a long time. You know, they're that typical green bird that you picture when you picture a pirate, for example, in the movies, sitting on the shoulder of the pirate. Great, great talkers, full of personality. Macaws, as you probably remember, they have very long tails. They're very elegant looking birds. And there are many, many different types of macaws that come in all different beautiful rainbow colors and patterns. But again, these are a really really big commitment because they require more space. They can be very loud and they definitely live a long, long time. So, I mean, things to think about, as Dr. Ravitch mentioned before, you know, again, longer lived birds, big cages, 
big spaces, big toys, more food. The longer you live, just like a person, the more apt you are to develop a medical problem at some point in life. And, and these birds do need checkups annually. But if they live into their you know, 50s, 60s, they can get atherosclerosis, which is hardening of their arteries. Sometimes they'll get that earlier, just the way we do if they're on a very high fat diet, just like people do. So those are things that we have to watch for, heart disease, strokes, things like that. So you have to be prepared to help treat these birds or try to prevent these problems and deal with them if they come up if you have a long-lived bird. So just things to think about before you, you, you know, adopt one or bring one into your home. So I thought something fun to kind of talk about would be the different types of parrots we've had or currently have and just kind of our experience and a little bit just on our thoughts of, of the parrots we've had. Yeah, well, I mentioned to you before that I've had a Pionis parrot, or I still have a Pionis parrot. He's phenomenal. He is very much a creature of habit. He does not rip his and shred his toys up. He likes them just where they are. For several years, he's had the same toys. He's, he doesn't like it when they're moved, but he likes them just the way he likes them. He's very addicted to television. When I first moved into my house, I didn't have cable, and he got very depressed and stopped eating. And the minute that the cable TV was hooked up, he just sat like a little junk food junkie and munched on his food and watched TV, and he was fine. But I was very concerned. <laughs> concerned about him at that time. On the opposite end of the spectrum, I have a Goffin's cockatoo, which is a smaller cockatoo. But again, as I mentioned before, very, very socially needy. He screams constantly when he's not in, out of his cage. Um, he needs to be with people all the time. And when he's in his cage, he needs to rip and shred and tear things up. And he's just very active and very verbal, very vocal, does do some talking. The more I think we teach him, the more he's apt to learn. But very, very, very different types of birds. And again, uh, you know, and not right for everybody. And your cockatoo has actually dismantled his cage from the inside out, hasn't yes. he? Yes. He's able to take his tongue and undo the screws and the nuts and the bolts in his cage. And I actually came home one day and he had peeled his cage sort of like an onion and he was wandering around the house. And it's lucky he's still here because I do have four cats and maybe they're afraid of him. But um, it was pretty interesting to see that happen. So I've had some experience with birds as well. I've actually fostered two birds. Both were found outside with no form of identification. One was a cockatiel. She was very debilitated and I kind of nursed her back to health and kept her for a while. And fostering birds can be great because there are many birds that, and, and adopting unwanted birds, there are many birds that don't have homes and basically like the many stray dogs that we have as well. So fostering birds and, and adopting rescue birds can be great. It's a little bit tricky because you don't always know what you're getting into. You don't know what their history is and what their personality is going to be like. With the cockatiel, she definitely was not interested in physically interacting. She didn't like it if we approached her with our hands. She'd get very nervous. But if we were around, she was so happy. She would chirp and she just loved being around people. She just didn't want to be touched. And then we found her a very nice home. And I also fostered a Quaker parrot that was also found outside. It's very common as there are many Quakers actually in living in colonies all across the U.S., unbeknownst to people, even in New York City. And some people that own a Quaker will actually release it thinking that they can survive. But a lot of times the pet Quakers don't quite have the same knowledge the wild Quakers do. And the Quaker parrot is actually a really good parrot for really anyone. She had a lot of personality. Um, we could teach her tricks. She was trainable. She loved to come out and interact. And she's a, a smaller size parrot. So she was great to have too. And we also found her a really nice home. So that's another thing to think about if you're thinking about getting a bird is looking into rescuing or fostering a bird because there are a lot of needy birds out there. It's kind of a great way to sort of try out and see whether this type of bird is the right fit for you. I mean, certainly all different types of birds have different personalities, so not every cockatiel is going to act the same way. But even just to try out to see whether a cockatiel is right for you, there are many, many uh, large parrot rescues on the Internet that have foster parents' spots open. So that's one thing you might want to consider if you're thinking about a bird. And in all these cases, as you see, there are so many birds out there. There's, it's not just parrots. There's many, many different kinds of parrots, and there's lots of birds out there that are not parrots that are great birds to try too. Just remember again, the same way you don't want to make a big hasty decision getting a dog or a cat or another common type of pet, you really want to think about what bird is right for you, your living situation, your family, the size of the space that you have available, your finances, and your time. These are all factors that we here at the Veterinary Center for Birds and Exotics in New York counsel people on all the time. And if we think about these things carefully, we can really prevent many of the birds from ending up in shelters. 
um, all across the country as we see it is a really, really big problem. So these are just many factors to consider. So I think we're out of time, but we are really excited about this topic. And if anyone has further questions for us, you can certainly reach us through our website at avian exotics with an S on the end, vet as in veterinarian.com. We're here at the Veterinary Center for Birds and Exotics. And please come back and listen to our next show at some point soon. And thank you so much for listening. We thank all of our producers for making this show possible. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.